It wasn't blasphemous, it wasn't wrong or evil, but the statement was made, you know, we're the body of Christ, and what we are is we're just a bunch of little Jesuses running around on the earth. I'm telling you, I take issues with that, but it's because I, first of all, can't make reference to if I'm a king in Christ and my kingly authority comes from Christ, there ain't no little king here, amen? And uh, you know what? Jesus, he's the creator of all things. He's God. There's no such thing as a little case Jesus or a lowercase Jesus or a little Jesus. There's just Jesus. Amen. All capital letters. Shout it out. Yell it out. Hallelujah. For those of you who like to yell when you text. You know how you yell when you text? All uppercase. Well, I'll tell you one thing. We need to be yelling and shouting the name of Jesus Christ. He is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. He is, I'm telling you. No little Jesus running around. Now, God bless it, brother. You know, I'm not preaching or saying anything against anybody. You know, I don't name names or nothing like that. Man's got a great anointing on his life, the power of God, the healing and miracles. But we're not a bunch of little Jesuses. We are the body of Christ. Amen. We are Christ. In the earth, we are his hands, his feet. Ain't no little hands, ain't no little feet. Amen. A little happy feet. Bigfoot. That's right. Thank you, Brother Bob. Always can use a little bit of help, you know. So, so if you accept the first Adam reality, then you also have to accept the second Adam reality. Hallelujah. And so we see here, though, where he talks about receiving the abundance of grace. There he's talking about getting a hold of it. You know, we need to get a hold of this. Don't you agree with that? And that's what this is all about, this preaching and teaching on, on grace and on Jesus. Is a, let's get a hold of it. It means to take it. So uh, let's take the abundance. The word abundance there, the Greek word parisia. Parisia means this. It means superabundance, excess. It means large amounts to be in excess, enough and to spare. Amen. So I want you, God's an excess God. Do you agree? Doesn't he expect you to live in his excess? I want you to know his excess is your excess. His largeness is your largeness and my largeness. His provision is your provision. And it ain't a little bit, is it? So we see that he says, receive the abundance of grace. It's a continuous present tense experience in God. Grace being charis, we found out here, means gift and favor. Now, the word favor there is very interesting, just breaking that down. It comes to the point of this, it means this, the attitude of approval our, or, or, or to be over generous preferential treatment. I want you to know that when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, He was over generous with you, not under generous with you. He's always going to be over generous with you, not under generous with you. Amen. And guess what? Some folks say, I don't like this preferential treatment. Well, I don't know about you, but I like it and I'll take it. Amen. I just want you to know because you're born of God and you're a child of God that in this world because of the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ upon your life, you because of God have preferential treatment. Do you ever, I'm sure there's many testimonies here right now that you can talk about that you know what, since I got saved, things seem to work out in my what? In my favor. Hallelujah. That's part of the receiving of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness that you may rule and reign in life. You have preferential treatment. Amen. You ought to expect it when you go into an establishment. I'm a king unto the Lord. I have preferential treatment and I have favor from God. Amen. I'm not telling you something that I don't practice. I do practice it. You know, I was in somewhere recently. Got the, well, we got tickets to go to this, the uh, Reno Tahoe Open. I think it's called something else this time. But you know what that is, the Reno Tahoe Open, right? Do we have any golfers here? Most of you don't golf. Amen. Well, anyway, it's a professional golf tournament. And we received VIP tickets. 
Somebody blessed us with VIP tickets. You know what that means? We got to go into the pavilion, and it was in the 18th hole, and it's this beautiful stretched, you know, the white tents, you know, and we're talking about gourmet buffet, um, just sitting right on the hole there where the water is. It's beautiful, and uh, uh, just all you can eat, whatever, just wonderful. And as I was going in, it was called the Lexus Pavilion. So you go in there and you think, okay, there's probably some, uh, some folks that it might be a little on the stuffy side, or maybe they're pretending to be stuffy because they got free tickets too. They just don't want to tell anybody. And these tickets are a buck seventy-five each. You know what a buck seventy-five is? That's short for hundred and seventy-five dollars. Amen. Bless the Lord. So I was going walking up to that thing, you know, and you know something just kind of hit. Just I don't know what it was. It was. It's just. It's just something that's out there. And it kind of hit my hit me in the head, and and I just believe it was demonic. It's like you don't belong here. Did you know that? That it was like that. You don't belong here. You don't fit in no. with these folks, no. you know. These are money people. No. These are rich people, wealthy people all sitting in there. You know, I, I don't think that. I want you to know I don't think that. That's not my thinking, right? right. And as I was going to approach it, I, I kind of felt a little bit of anxiety. And I'm thinking, man, what's going on with me? i got to get back and meditate a little more on the Word. And as I was approaching, I recognized it right away. It's just the devil himself trying to put some kind of a something on you to keep you from walking in your kingly worthiness. And I'm going along, and I'm thinking that, and I'm going, say what? Friend didn't know about it, but, I, you know, I was dealing with it on the inside of me. I said to myself, I said, I am worthy to be here. They do not realize those folks sitting in there, and if they're not saved, that there's a, uh, right now, there's a king that's going to walk into this pavilion. A king, you understand? A king, not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done. And I squared my shoulders back. I thought about and meditated on that. And that thing, that just whatever it was, that, well, that fiery dart just left me. And I walked in there with authority. Why? Because I am a king and a priest unto my God. Amen. I am receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness that I may reign in this life. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you what, I felt perfectly comfortable and in place in that place. Are you listening? We got to get our thinking up. You know, there's some folks here that, you know, not here, but I know people that, that have, they, they actually are people of means, but they still have a poverty mentality. How you have that at the same time, I don't know. But they will not go and sit in a restaurant. If they see the restaurant has white tablecloths, they think, no, I'm not going in there. Well, first of all, they don't want to spend the money. You know, too much money. It's white tablecloths, too much money, man. Whatever. But they just think, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you, we had some folks that we were traveling with, and we booked so a nice, beautiful hotel, man. This was in Spain, and it was on the, on, on the, on the uh, at Atlant Atlantic Ocean side. You know, we like, you got the beautiful Mediterranean and all. And uh, so I researched, did my homework, and we stayed in this amazing hotel resort. We were on vacation back in 2001, and the family members that we were traveling with, they wanted to stay somewhere else. Guess what? The other place was kind of, well, just, it just wasn't anything up to par to what this place was. And it was the same amount of money. And it was totally inferior to this resort hotel. They were offended by the fact. And you know what they said to us? They said to me and friends, they said, we don't want to stay here. I, I, I said, why? Because this is for rich people. But yet, the ones who are traveling here are probably more wealthy than most of the people that were there. And so I said to him, I said, well, that's okay. We belong here because we're rich. <laughs> Amen. We're rich. Of course, I mean, I'm rich in Christ. Amen. I'm in faith for that to match up with my pocketbook too, by the way. Are you listening? But I felt, Francis and I, we just felt, no, we, this is, we booked this, but first of all, I've got a good deal on it. Come on. How many of y'all like good deals? So why do I want to stay in the deluxe hotel down the street that's got geckos on the wall catching the flies and the bugs. Hello, when I can stay in this beautiful, magnificent hotel for the same price and get free breakfast every morning. 
Hello, and we're talking about a major buffet, man. But what, what amazed me was the mentality and the thinking. This is not, we don't belong here. This is for rich people. You know what, folks? I'm going to tell you something. You want to rule reign in life, you're going to have to get your thinking up. Are you born again? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Then you should stay in the finest hotels and eat in the finest restaurant. You belong there. You belong there. Amen. If you want to put money in it, you know, it's up to you. Save your money. All right. But don't, don't, my, my point in all of this is, you know, stay where you want to stay. Eat where you want to eat. But don't ever, as a child of God, feel like you don't belong somewhere that, you know, because of a poverty mentality. That's not the thinking of Christ. Amen? Because if you think that way, then you're probably going to feel that way when you're in heaven. I don't belong here. It's for rich people. Hello, what do you think that table setting is going to look like? Amen? What do you think that mansion that you're going to live in is going to look like? Huh? You know, it's going to be amazing, isn't it? Well, did you know that His will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What's His will on heaven? What do you think His will is on the earth for the children of God? Did you know that Bible talks about the wealth of the planet, that God did not intend it for the wicked, but He intended it for the covenant people and the righteous people? And it's an amazing thing how folks get offended if the righteous are walking in the blessing of this, but they're not offended by the wicked being able to mine it and obtain it. What's up with that? You know, when somebody came to me one time, they said, because I'm a minister, they said, well, what do you think about all this money being spent on these big, beautiful buildings for churches? Yeah, I was thinking, like, it's about time. Hello? You know, what do you think about all that money being spent on that? And you know what my reply to them was? Oh, and they didn't know what to say. I said, well, what do you think about all that money that's being spilled out, building all these big casinos? What do you think about that? Hmm? Huh? I said, it's amazing you're okay with that. But when it comes to the man and woman of God and the children of God, and they serve and honor the God that owns all the material that creates those casinos, God owns it all on the earth, it's okay for the wicked to have it, but you don't want the righteous to have it. What's wrong with you, man, sister? And it was a sister, by the way. I want you to know it was a sister. I think, what, what, what's happening here? Amen. It's getting quiet in me. Get, don't get quiet on me now. Praise God. Give me a courtesy amen. amen. All right. Well, to reign. Now, the word there, to reign, is this, to rule as a king. It speaks of, in the context of it, within a, on a foundation of power as a sovereign king. Hallelujah. And so he says, They that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now, moving on to verse 18, he says, Therefore, as by, by the offense of one, judgment came. Not so good, amen. Upon what? All men to what? Condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto what? Justification of life. I want to look at that word condemnation for a moment. And we're going to look at it in the Greek. And what the Greek word is, is katakrima. Katakrima. Which actually, it's two words into one. And what it means is this. It means adverse sentence the verdict, to judge against and to condemn, to decide judicially, to sue at law, hello, to be found guilty and sentenced. Did you know that that's where you were at one time? And that's what Paul's saying. That's the position that we were in. Basically, when Adam fell, all of humanity got sued. <laughs> Amen. And it's making reference. It's a judicial law term. And the verdict was handed down. And we were all condemned. The Bible says that we were all condemned to death. But I want you to know that God had a plan. Amen. He's the righteous judge. And the good news is this, that he, can't, he had a solution. And Adam spoke of it before he left the garden. 
He talked about the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. And so the plan was this, that Jesus Christ, of course, the Son of the living God would come and take our place. But what I want to do is, before we go any further, is I want to look over there at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to see exactly how God handled this whole situation. Then we're going to come back to this passage again. So John chapter 2, we there? Praise the Lord. 2 and verse 1. Let's read it together. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. Praise the Lord. Right when I said sin not, I just sinned. That's called missing the mark, you know. Hello? My hands, I swing. When, all right. Well, anyway, that you do what? That you sin not. You know, we can stop right there. And I think a lot of times folks do stop right there. You know, the Bible says sin not, you know. Of course it does. Amen. Let's read the rest of it. And if any man sins. Oh, come on now. If any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hallelujah. Do you know that the word advocate there in the Greek is this, it means an intercessor, a counselor, and guess what? A lawyer. So, if, if any man does sin, we have a lawyer. And what does a lawyer do? He goes before the judge on behalf of the accused or the condemned or the convicted. And as I just read to you over there in Romans where he talks about the condemnation came to all, the, the verdict was passed down. The judgment was given and it was pronounced. And the death sentence was given to all humanity. And so God in his infinite wisdom and Jesus came up with a plan. God is the judge. And I love it. Jesus is our lawyer. And like one one, one person put it, Jesus leaned over to the accused, which was, was you and me, and leaned over and said, don't worry, my dad's the judge. I think you're in pretty good shape when you got the judge is the dad and your lawyer is the son of the judge. And who was the prosecutor? Anybody know? Satan was the, the, he was the prosecutor, and he, the Bible says, is the accuser of the brethren, and you are the accused, and you are the defendant, and Jesus is the great lawyer, and God is the great judge, and God, in this plan to do it right and to do it legally, someone had to pay the price. Someone had to take the death penalty, because it was a death penalty, and Jesus stepped in our place the perfect sinless Son of God, the perfect sinless Lamb of God, and He took our place and exchanged our sin for His righteousness. He went to prison so that you could be sprung from prison, so that you could be released, amen. He went down and He was tormented, and He went and He was, he was executed so that you could get out of that chair and get out of that death chamber. Praise God for that. Amen. And the reason why death couldn't hold him, because just death had no justification, had no legal right or access to him. Amen. He was an innocent man himself. And so he went down there, and so justice said there, because he was dead, died as an innocent person, then the guilty that was put on him was freed and innocent as well. Amen. Praise God for that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Amen. So I want you to know that my dad is the judge, too. Because you know what's really good about that? He didn't just stop right there by being our advocate and our lawyer and stepping in and just saying, I'll take the death sentence upon myself. Not only did he do that, but he said, Judge, Dad, I want to adopt him, too. I want them to be my brothers. Can we just bring them into the family? Did you know that your dad's a judge and he's the greatest judge in the universe? 
but he's not your judge anymore. He can't be your judge. You know why? Because you can't have double jeopardy. Jesus has already been judged and condemned. The law and the sentence and the courtroom, it's all been settled. It's been done. And you can't be tried for the same thing again and again and again. Amen? Thank God for that. So what was it? He said this. He says that we've been declared righteous means this, that you have been acquitted. That's exactly what it means when he says that you have been, when you receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, that righteousness means this, that you've been justified, that you've been declared innocent, and that you have been acquitted of the crimes that were against you, that you were guilty of, but you have now been acquitted through what Jesus has done. Amen. And you have been found and declared innocent in the presence of God. Say it with me. How do I? How, listen, I want to ask you, how do you plead? How do you plead? Do you plead what? Not guilty. Not only that, you plead innocent. And not only that, if anybody challenges it like the devil, then you just say, I plead the blood. Say, I plead the blood. Aren't you glad? Praise the Lord. Now I want to conclude this morning's service by going back over now to um, um, Romans chapter 5. And I want to read this from the um, message paraphrase. Say paraphrase. Yeah, that's right. It's not a translation. It is a paraphrase, but it's so rich and good. And uh, so let me get it over here on, in my Bible as well. I don't have my screen in front of me tonight, today, and it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. I need somebody to give me something to throw at it. Uh, you know, sometimes you just got to jiggle the thing a little bit, right? Hit it. All right. Praise the Lord. So, um, again, Romans chapter 5, and we're going to, again, I'll read it from verse 12 and that whole passage back all the way down to the bottom. And uh, I think it just sums it all up and brings it all together. So he says, you know the story of how Adam landed us in the dilemma, 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 dilemma we're in. First sin, then death, and no one exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relations with God and everything and everyone. But the extent of the disturbance was not clear until God spelled it out in detail to Moses. So death this huge abyss separating us from God dominated the landscape from Adam to Moses. Even those who didn't sin precisely as Adam did by disobeying a specific command of God still had to experience this termination of life, this separation from God. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. That's good, isn't it? Verse 15 through verse 17 now in the message. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead-end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous, life-giving gift. The verdict on that one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes, sovereign life, in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right, that the one man Jesus Christ provides. Here it is in a nutshell. This is verse 18 and 19. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. Isn't that great? But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you're out of trouble? Man, I'll tell you what, oh, so-and-so got himself in trouble. I got myself into life. Amen. Did you get yourself into life? I shouldn't have looked away. Now i got to find my place again. Here it is. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. 
one man said yes to God and put many in the right. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers, didn't it? But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. Amen. Now it's getting kind of excited now, isn't it? Now wake up. I know some of you went to sleep on me. Come on back. All right. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins, come on, hands down. All sin can do is threaten us with death. That's the end of it. It's just a threat, isn't it? Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life, a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. Amen. Now, that's good news, isn't it? The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I hope you were blessed by the message today. I like to um, always close our program out by giving folks an opportunity to make the most important decision that they will ever make in their life. And I say not just this life, but eternal life. Because every one of us are going to live forever. You are a spirit being. You have a soul and you live in a physical body. And your spirit and your soul live on for eternity. The question is, is where will you spend eternity? And that choice, of course, is left up to you. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save men's lives. And so he is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. And he wants to be the Lord of your life. So I invite you right now to receive Jesus Christ, not just as your Savior, but as your Lord. Meaning this, he's the Lord of your decisions. He's the Lord of your choices that you make in life. He's the Lord of your lifestyle. And that's how you distinguish between a Christian, one who says that they believe in Jesus, and another one who has received Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. And I believe that there are some out there right now, you say that you're a Christian, but Jesus is really not the Lord of your life. Well, it's time to surrender wholly and completely to him. So if you're one who says, yeah, I go to church, well, that's good. But is Jesus Lord of your life? And so I invite you all, everyone, to receive, the, receive him as Lord and Savior right now by praying this simple prayer. Pray this out loud to the Lord. Mean it with all of your heart. Say this, dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I confess I am a sinner and I am need of a Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. God, I believe that you raised him from the dead. And your word says, if I believe it, if I confess it, then I would be saved. And so today, I confess Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Lord, I ask you to come into my heart and save me now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I believe that you got born again in your spirit. Now it's time for you to get plugged into a local church. And I want to invite you to any one of our services on Sunday at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Also, we have Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. Help us, uh, well, come and let us help you grow spiritually. God bless you. And beside the river. Thank you for watching Demonstrations of Faith, a ministry outreach of Faith Alive Christian Center in Reno, Nevada. If you don't have a home church, we invite you to come and connect with us. We have ministry for the entire family on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Our Connect Youth Ministry meets on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Child care is available for all services. Our location is 120 Hubbard Way, half block east of the Pepper Mill in Reno. You can find us online at faithalive.net or by searching for Faith Alive at all social media outlets. Thanks for watching and join us next week for Demonstrations of Faith. 
and it's flowing to me.